Leia here from LeiaVersai.com and in this video we'll do a quick but thorough overview of the alkene reactions following along with my alkene reaction cheat sheet so that you can quickly and easily identify products without going through the mechanism. You can find the cheat sheet, my entire mechanism series, and alkene reactions practice quiz by visiting my website linked in the description below. The first reaction we'll look at is catalytic reduction or hydrogenation, which comes from hydrogen, meaning we react an alkene with H2 in some metal catalysts like platinum or palladium carbide. I'll just put PD for palladium. The trick here is to break the pi bond and add a hydrogen atom to each of the carbons, keeping in mind that this is a syn addition. Because of the metal catalyst grabbing the pi bond, the pi bond is grabbed from the same face, meaning both carbons are grabbed together, so the hydrogens will be added to the same side. Now here you can't tell that they're syn because we have a terminal carbon, but if your starting molecule was, for example, a cyclohexene, you would show both hydrogens as dashes or both hydrogens as wedges. The next reaction is hydrohalogenation. This comes from hydro, meaning hydrogen, and halogen, meaning X. You'll see this reaction written out as HX, for example, HCl, HBr, reacting in some inert catalysts, and some of your professors won't even show that. The trick for this reaction is to break the pi bond and place the hydrogen on the less substituted carbon, knowing that the more substituted carbon would form a carbocation. In this case, don't forget that we have a secondary carbocation forming near a tertiary carbon. That means we'll have a hydride shift. We can show that over here so that your final product will be somewhat unexpected. You get the hydrogen here from the HCl. We get the hydrogen here from the hydride shift, and the chlorine adds into the tertiary carbon after the carbocation rearrangement. This reaction follows Markovnikov's rule. As you saw, we had a carbocation intermediate. That is your key. If there is a carbocation intermediate, it will follow Markovnikov's rule. Because we have a carbocation intermediate, we do not have syn or anti-addition because the chlorine can add from either face of the sp2 hybridized carbocation. This reaction is under standard conditions. However, if you take that same starting molecule, react it with the same intermediate HX, in this case we'll show it as HBr, but this time we put it under radical conditions, meaning peroxide, extreme heat, light, the product is going to be anti-Markovnikov, so you break the pi bond, start out by putting the halogen anti-Markovnikov, the radical forms on the more substituted carbon, and then the hydrogen follows. And so your product has the hydrogen more substituted and the halogen on the less substituted carbon. Halogenation is very similar to hydrohalogenation, except without the H we're adding two halogens, for example Br2 or Cl2. In this case we react with Br2, the key is to break the pi bond and put one halogen on either carbon that used to be double bound, but this is an anti-addition. That means that they'll add to opposite faces of the pi bond due to that bromonium or if you had chlorine, cl chloronium intermediate. The bridge will block whatever face it's on so that the other halogen has to add opposite. For this molecule, you can't tell because the terminal carbon is primary, but if you were to show dashes and wedges, you would show one of them as a dash and one of them as a wedge to show that it's an anti-addition. This reaction is carried out in an inert solvent, so for example, CH2Cl2 or CCl4, meaning the solvent doesn't react. This is to differentiate between halohydrin formation, where everything looks the same except for the fact that we have a reactive solvent, a polar protic solvent like water. The reaction starts out the same way you break the pi bond, but this time the solvent will also participate in the reaction, adding to the more substituted carbon. So you'll place a halogen on the less substituted carbon, take your solvent and draw it out, in this case we have HOH, and cut off one of the hydrogens, add the rest of that group, in this case it's an OH. The reason I'm telling you to do this is what if your solvent was methanol, same thing, cut off a hydrogen, and add the rest of it. The product is a halohydrin where the halogen is on the less substituted carbon and the solvent minus the hydrogen is on the more substituted carbon. That gives us halo, halogen, and hydrogen, water, or in this case, OH. Just like with halogenation, there is a halogen bridged intermediate, so it's going to be an anti-addition. That means 
bromine and OH will be on opposite faces of the pi bond, but it's also considered a Markovnikov addition because the final group, the solvent, will add to the more substituted carbon due to that partial positive character in the intermediate. I explained this in detail in the mechanism video, so if you're confused, go back and watch that video. For acid catalyzed hydration, or simply hydration, think of hydrate, water. We're adding H2O to the molecule, and we're using an acid catalyst. You'll see this written as H2O, H3O+, water and acid like H2SO4. All of this tells you that we're adding the OH. So you want to break the pi bond, put the hydrogen on the less substituted carbon, that's because it's a Markovnikov addition, and keep in mind the carbocation intermediate, which would form on the more substituted carbon, but if you have potential for a carbocation rearrangement, in this case you have a hydride shift, make sure that the carbocation winds up on the ultimate more substituted carbon if it's one carbon over. The product of this reaction has a hydrogen on the least substituted carbon. In this case we have another hydrogen on the more substituted carbon because of the hydride shift, and then OH on the carbon that held the final carbocation intermediate. Because of the carbocation, we don't have a syn or anti-addition because of that sp2 flat intermediate. But we do have Markovnikov's rule, as you can tell, with the carbocation intermediate. Let's look at oxymercuration and alkoxymercuration at the same time. Both of them have the oxy for oxygen, merc for mercury, and the only difference is we have an alkyl group in the second reaction. The reagents are nearly the same for both of these reactions. The key here is the merc portion in the name, and that's mercury. We'll show HgOAC2. Now the difference is that for oxymercuration, we're adding H2O. For alkoxymercuration, we're adding an alkyl chain, so it'll be ROH. Think of H2O as HOH, and alkoxy is ROH. Step two is sodium borohydride. The trick here is to recognize that this is a Markovnikov reaction, meaning we have a semi-carbocation intermediate, but mercury acts as a carbocation babysitter, does not allow it to shift. So even though it's Markovnikov, we have no carbocation rearrangement. We break the pi bond, put a hydrogen on the less substituted carbon, in oxymercuration, we add an OH on the more substituted carbon. In alkoxymercuration, we add an OR. If that ROH is methanol, you would add a OCH3. If it's ethanol, you would add an OET, and so on. Given the mechanism of this reaction, it's Markovnikov and also anti-addition. That means that if you have to show chirality, the H and OH will add on opposite faces, one as a dash and one as a wedge. Hydroboration oxidation is another hydration reaction, only this one is anti-Markovnikov, where the previous ones we looked at were Markovnikov. For this reaction, we're using BH3 and THF in the first step, NaOH, H2O2, sometimes you'll also see H2O in the second step. This is an anti-Markovnikov reaction, meaning the hydrogen adds to the more substituted carbon, but the alcohol adds to the less substituted carbon. However, they add to the same face of the pi bond, making it a syn addition. That means if you're showing chirality, the H and OH will both be dashes or both be wedges, even though it's anti-Markovnikov so that the OH is on the less substituted carbon. Epoxidation is an interesting reaction because we're taking that alkene and turning it into an epoxide by reacting it with a per acid. A per acid, per means extra oxygen, so it'll look like a carboxylic acid, but instead of an RCO2H, it'll be CO3H, where that third oxygen makes it the per acid and gives you that peroxide. The trick here is to break the pi bond, put an oxygen in between the two carbons, and almost imagine that the pi bond reaches out and skewers that oxygen, so it's attached to both of those carbons. Since the oxygen is attached to both carbons, by default it has to be a syn addition because there's no way to have it attached to the same carbons and somehow be on opposite faces of the pi bond. A common peracid that you'll see is MCPBA. When you see that, instantly recognize an epoxide as the product. Some of you may have seen this in conjunction with a second reaction, reacting this with H3O plus to give you a dihydroxylation product. 
where dihydroxylation means you have two OHs. The first OH has the oxygen from the epoxide, a hydrogen from the solvent. The second OH comes from the acid catalyst, the H3O+. This reaction does have a carbocation intermediate, but that intermediate doesn't fully let go of the carbon, forcing the other OH to add from the opposite side, making this an anti-addition. There are two more dihydroxylation reactions you'll see that'll both give you a syn addition product, meaning the OHs will add on the same face of the pi bond. The first one is reacting KMnO4, a strong oxidizing agent, but under weak conditions in cold temperature and a dilute solution. The second one is OSO4, osmium tetroxide. This reaction will break just the pi bond and add an OH to each of the carbons on the same face of the pi bond so that if you have to show chirality, they'll both be dashes or both be wedges. Oxidative cleavage, as the name implies, is an oxidation reaction that not only cleaves the pi bond, it also cleaves the single bond completely separating those two carbons. The trick for any oxidative cleavage reaction is to simply draw a line between the two carbons that are pi bound to each other and put an oxygen on either side of the break. The question of what else you add to the pieces will depend on the reagent that you're using. If we use KMnO4, but this time under hot conditions, we're going to get a highly oxidized molecule where any primary carbon will become a carboxylic acid. Notice that when we slice it, this carbon here becomes primary. Redraw the molecule exactly as you see it, and then turn the terminal carbon into a carboxylic acid. If it's secondary, it'll be a ketone, and if it's a single carbon, you get CO2, carbon dioxide. Ozonolysis is another reaction you'll see for oxidative cleavage, but the products will be determined by the workup in the second step. In step one, you use ozone. In step two, for a reductive workup, you'll use something like CH32S, which is DMS. For an oxidative workup, you'll use H2O2, hydrogen peroxide. The skeleton is the same for the oxidative or reductive workup. It's simply a question of what happens to your terminal carbon. In reductive conditions, we get a hydrogen for an aldehyde product, in oxidative conditions, we get an OH for a carboxylic acid. The single carbon product under reductive conditions will be a formaldehyde, an aldehyde with just one carbon. Under oxidative conditions, it'll be a carboxylic acid. Not quite carbon dioxide, but it's slightly more oxidized than your aldehyde. The last reaction I have on the cheat sheet is cyclopropanation, and as the name implies, we're creating a cyclopropane, a three-carbon chain. Some of your professors may not cover this reaction at all. Some of you will learn just one, and some of you may learn both reactions. For the first one, we're reacting CH2I2 in a zinc-copper catalyst. And for the second one, we're reacting CHX3, for example, Cl3, in a solution of NaOH and H2O. The skeleton of the product is the same. So when you see this reaction, cut off your pi bond and create a ring, just like we did with epoxidation, but this time we're using a carbon instead of oxygen to create that three-membered ring. But the question is, what else do we put onto this reaction? The trick is knowing what we do after we create that cyclopropane. The key here is to remember that one, your substituents on carbon has to be two of the same, and two, that you have to remove at least one halogen. Again, this is without going through the mechanism, just a trick to recognize. If we have to remove at least one halogen for the Simmons-Smith reaction, and the group that we add here has to be the same, well, we just cut off both halogens, leaving us with two hydrogens. Because remember, we have to cut at least one halogen, but then we'll only have one halogen left, so just cut them both off. For the second one, if we cut off just one halogen, Cl3 becomes Cl2, we can still add two chlorines. And that's the answer for this one. So when you see three halogens, two of them stay on your product. When you see two halogens, none of them stay on your product. And given that this product has a ring, 
it's technically considered a sin addition because there's no other way to add the rank. This concludes all of the reactions that I have outlined on my alkene reaction cheat sheet. I'd love to hear your feedback. If you like this type of video, just let me know by leaving a comment below. And remember, you can download the alkene reaction cheat sheet, access the alkene mechanism tutorial videos, and of course, try the alkene practice quiz by visiting my website, layofersci.com slash alkene reactions.